my mom was sadia you are a coward the pain you went through every other woman goes through during delivery so you are a coward simply you are afraid of the pain just that we have culturalized our religion and at the same point we have taken our cultural aspects to be religious a practice come to this campaign knowing that you are not competing with anybody you want to save a girl even if it's one girl that's a big step for us this is the end of gm podcast with sadia hussein Welcome to the End FGM podcast. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. I spend time with change makers who are making an impact in Kenya and beyond. Each week we listen to incredible stories of ordinary people just like you making a difference. They share their successes, failures, and what they are learning along the way. Thank you for being with me today. Let's get started. If my community is controlling the sexuality of the girl, practicing FGM actually to reduce my sexual urge and desires. What are you doing? They will laugh at you. you actually you are clapping for them for job well done. That's a wise thought. On the contrary, on the contrary, I would say this to challenge them. I'm a survivor. I know um FGM as effects the effects are are varying across survivors. Every survivor has her own unique story on FGM. I've done several um research. Not the research, the statistics the population council the UNICEF UNFPA does no. This is my own campaign based research. When I go to certain um, village and I want I educate them again uh, against the harmful cultures like Ali Maritina and all those things. I sit down with the women. I ask them, "Do you enjoy sex with your man?" They will tell me yes. When I came to realize those who say they don't. There are those who actually tell me they don't. Through my analysis, I came across this and I have to tell the world, eh? In our community we have arranged marriages in most cases this is a young girl her father chose her the kind of uh, husband she would stay with how do you expect her to enjoy what is she going to enjoy a young girl who doesn't even know what marriage life is what is she going to enjoy actually she will tell you i'm not enjoying anything secondly We have those women who are staying with their and partners by chance. What do you mean? I mean like this. For example, you 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 just got married. In our community, you go, you go, you choose uh like this family background all those you do assessments and you say I want lady X. Uh they the other day you will you will find there is a wedding procession and all that. it's final so how do you expect people who don't even have affection for themselves to enjoy what are you enjoying in the first place for me and i want to be very very honest and i want to challenge everybody this is what my community tells me when i talk about the sexual desires and all this they tell me sadia for that you know you, you need to go and do pre- restructure your campaign why because If you talk of the sexual desires for example you if you we we would have taken your words that it's true for example maybe our men are marrying four wives because we were cut what about those neighbors who are not cut but their men are still cheating on them they are still going for other if they are that satisfactory making their men sat, uh, satisfied why are these men cheating Sadia, I'd like I'd like us to just talk about because now you're bringing a point that I've always wondered about. Mm-hmm. How should we frame these messages? Because you've talked about two things. First, you've talked about, you know, how do you tell people about FGM and sexuality? 
you also talked about FGM and um, how to communicate it about religion also. How do you frame these messages? Uh, for me, let me be honest. From my own personal experience, I love a person, right? For me, let me tell you, to be honest, eh? sincerely speaking, when I meet, I meet several men, because that's the nature of my work. I meet men like every day, right? And I don't feel them. But for this one man that I love, leave alone him talking to me, just by seeing him. I just feel the electric shock. Exactly. And I don't know. Sometimes I sit somewhere and question myself. What are these people talking about? You see, um, for me, I believe FG and, and sexual desires comes from the mind. And also, it depends with the kind of love you have for that person. Even if the, it doesn't mean even the person loves you back. If the woman loves that man, she will automatically feel him. Yes. And for you to enjoy sex, you must have that affection. You must have that feeling. Okay. We now go to how we, sh we should frame. This is my argument always when I go to our women. <laughs> when you are telling me you are, doing, you are doing FGM to control my sexual desires, to control my virginity. First, to begin with, I've been born with virginity. Natural virginity. That's why I begin. There is this natural virginity. Once broken, it will never be recovered. Why now go for an artificial one? That's our, deep, that's our starting conversation point. You see, you're trying to say that um, the focus should be, you know, is not like preserving this second virginity um, for the future husband. Yes, I tell them, this girl has been born with a natural virginity. Preserve that. How? We need to build their moral, uh, we need to give them moral support. We need, we need to mentor them and teach them the values uh, that they should have. We, sh we must nurture uh, them and prepare them that it's good to preserve their virginity. That's it. Secondly, this is another argument I bring. In case, for example, this is a human being, things get out of the way sometimes. Even those who have um, gone through FGM still also can do things outside wedlock. So, when it comes to preserving for the man, why the man? Who is controlling or measuring the virginity of the man? Why torture this woman when you don't even have a guarantee that he will stay with you forever? Nowadays, men are even marrying fellow men. Why should you care pleasing him while you are torturing yourself, while you are torturing your daughter, and you, you cannot even guarantee that this man you are preparing your girl or harming your girl for may not even stay with her for long? Why? That's the second argument. Now, the third argument I make. <laughs> Does it mean if I'm not cut today, I will, I, will, I will be sleeping with men around? It depends with the faith I will have. Once I went to a radio and a, a man called and told me, Saadia, can you sleep in a, in a house without a door? And I said, no. How? And he was telling me, yes, FGM is like a door for us. It's a lock. And I told him, listen, even if you mutilate the girl hundred times, it's only herself who can look after herself. Because there is no permanent lock you have put there. You cannot even tell what the, that girl is doing. She's just looking after herself. You are not mo monitoring her. That means, again, if she doesn't go through the cut, it's her faith. By fearing her God and also her own dignity. You know, there is that dignity you want to preserve. You want to be a role model. Do you want to be called so many names or you want to be a role model to your children? You know, I want, when I walk, my daughters will be very proud of me as a mother. Not as a mother who is that cheap. 
everyone would be talking about. No, I would want my daughters to feel proud and say, we want to be like our mother. So I tell them, the lock you are talking about simply depends on my faith and the way I want to, to be like. What I get from that is investing in building our children's morals other than trying to put gates um, where people are forced to um, be in check because of cultural barriers and say like female genital mutilation, which ends up harm, being harmful to them. But this one thing I haven't been able to grasp quite a while. Um, you've been working with women. Uh, you've been working with women from Daya Women Group. Of course, they are survivors and they are also role models within the communities and saying, you know, I've been through this and I have seen whatever uh, we are talking about, speaking out of experience and we are living examples and uh, we have not cut our daughters. How is it like being a woman in that religion and in that culture and working in communities that truly believe that, you know, this is part of our culture and our religion? How is it like? I would say it takes a brave woman to actually stand in front of these men and challenge them. You know, sometimes there is that Somali proverb that says, La fagari When you want to break the bone of a giraffe, look for another bone from the same giraffe to break that bone. If I want to talk with women, I should stand in front of them. Because I've gone through FGM. I cannot take and cut woman to address the survivors. I'm a survivor. I'm at, in a better place to address them. You see? And again, when we want to talk to the men, I will take a man to speak to them. Probably a religious leader. That's a credible voice. They would listen to the religious leader rather than me. You see? When we want to bring the health effects and bring now the data, like for example, when we want to compare the cut women versus the uncut and delivering at hospitals, we need to bring up the data of even caesarean sections, the referrals, all these. And we need a medical doctor to do that. Because if I come with a paper, they think I've cooked up. Maybe you just came up with the data and uh, you, you cannot validate them. I can't defend. <laughs> but for, for the doctor, he starts by challenging them. Uh, How many of you have, have I attended to? Like during delivery at maternity, at the maternity. Then they lift up their hands. Yes. And it, it turns out that majority of them have gone through his hands. That means... He is in a better place to make them understand what actually happens practically in the hospital. Most of the women who go for referrals are our community from our community. Most of the, those who die on the road as they are being taken by ambulance for the referrals due to complicated deliveries are actually majority of them come from my religion, from my community. And... Uh, when we now talk of coming from that culture and also the religion, this is how we challenge them. We have those Muslims who don't cut their daughters and their imams. So our men go to pray in those mosques where the imam actually comes from the community that, that does not even practice FGM. So my work is actually very easy. We know when we want to talk to the young men who should talk to them, we strategize ourselves. We want to go out to a village and we know eh, mobilizing them. They will ask for allowance. We don't have the money. We are volunteers. So basically, we come with the public address, put music. You know, the entertainment is just wow. So we have end FGM songs. They come gather, dance with us. After the dance, what follows? If the majority is men, I just call. Now, today I came. I'm a survivor of FGM. I'm one of you. But I don't want to talk. Let's listen from the religious leader. Whatever he says. Are we going to buy or what are we going to say? And they say, no. This is the sheikh that we value. This is a credible voice. 
whatever Sheikh so and so says is final. Ah, and my work is done. So I just sit, wait for the Sheikh to give his statements about the religion. After that, we give chance to the men. We now give chance to the survivors from Daya to also share the experience. And as I share experience, by the way, I also ask them, uh -huh. when we go to hospital, have you seen the uncut being cut by a pair of scissors? And they say, no. Why us? Uh, they will answer. You know, that's how I take the debate on. And that interactive session, there is nothing to hide. For me, people tell me, you need to separate the women. You talk to women and, uh, alone, separately, and also men separately. I don't do that. For Daya, we bring them on board, all of them. <laughs> the debate, in the first place, women feel shy. Oh, there are men here. But when the religious leaders hits on, because they don't shy away from talking about the family issue, they start saying, yes, these are bad issues, but God has said anything that is um, a sin should be talked about for to save the community from um, that that issue so you see um, basically when the now religious leader starts oh um this is fgm is like this and now they start okay they start feeling it's normal to talk about it so you see uh gradually they start now asking questions the women themselves start asking questions okay what about this and actually i came to realize that even the the prayers we are talking about the five time um prayers the five daily prayers for a girl to perform it she should not go through the card for those who are infibulated uh, are not are not supposed to go through uh, pray the prayer cannot perform the prayers actually i came to learn recently even for me I've, I'm, I'm now learning a lot from the religious leaders and some of them were shocked actually and they have said oh god forgive us now they're repenting. Is it like little girls are allowed to to do their prayers and maybe women who are married or already cut are not allowed? I'd like you to expand on that. Okay, uh, this is what it means. Eh? There is a certain age, like when uh, children reach the age of 10 years, they're supposed to start praying. Like the parents should start showing how to pray and teach the little ones how to perform prayers. Now, for our case, uh, we, we, we do the infibulation type of FGM, the type 3. So the sheikh was saying, since um, the girl is infibulated, you know, you need to wash yourself. You need to clean yourself before you even perform wudu. Wudu is um, supplication. Uh, no, sub, not supplication. It's um, ablution. <laughs> ablution so ablution you can't perform the ablution um before cleaning your your private parts so for them they believe that infibulated girl is closed how where, where, what are you washing how can you wash yourself so the argument is the girl cannot perform the prayers and we are denying them actually so how how long will you wait until they get married so you see um that means if they die before the age of marriage, those girls, you have denied them the, their rights to pray. And now who is carrying those sins? Who is carrying the sins? FGM is actually something that's not in our religion, something that we should condemn with the strongest term possible, something that our society something that our community really, really need to say, this thing is, should not happen to our girls. And those girls who are innocent should also know that what is awaiting them is not a joke. They should know that there is a pain that's endless. Because I always say FGM is a lifetime complication, Yes, a lifetime concept. It's not something that will end during the cut. It's something that will continue following. The pains, the agony, the psychological trauma, and also the other effects follow you 
until you finish uh, giving birth. So you see, um, the community should actually focus on the religious part, and re since that um, religion does not av advocate for FGM, I think that's the part we should focus on, and we should actually make sure that we follow what our religious leaders are telling us. So today we want to bring this to a close, um, but I wouldn't let you go without um, giving a piece of advice to people who are working in this anti-FGM field, uh, trying to bring this change within their communities. Of course, communities have different ways of approaching FGM, and they have their own reasons why they are doing so. So is there something that you would like to give as a piece of advice to someone who wants to start running any campaigns or running an organization that deals with uh, trying to sensitize and bring a change uh, in this deeply ingrained practice in this community? I, I, first of all, I want to challenge yourself. You. I want to challenge you. Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Um, you know, there was this HIV thing. When someone is a victim of HIV, they were usually stigmatized. Living within that society was really horrible. Actually, some of them would want to commit suicide. Others were also committing suicide before even before ARVs and all these were introduced. Some, it was the end of them. You know, let me tell you one thing. Before I even give a piece of advice, I want to challenge everyone who wants to end FGM. Do we want survivors to come out and share their stories? Or we want to sugarcoat and uh, we want to go with peppers and talk about FGM in the way we understand? Or we want facts about ending FGM? For a survivor to come out and talk about FGM, you must appreciate that this survivor went through FGM without her consent. For me, if I had the chance to choose, I wouldn't opt for FGM. Like the way my daughters are. What will happen when my daughter is, in, is standing in front of me, talking all those nonsense? Oh, survivors are not killing. Mm, those who go through FGM are, no, are these, are blah, blah, blah. They talk a lot of nonsense about us. How do you think I will go to a TV and confess that I'm a survivor? See, I will deny. Exactly. And that's why many survivors don't want to share their stories because they feel, what about the branding outside? That survivors don't have the sexual life. Survivors are like these. Survivors are, you know, a lot of issues branded. We are carrying a lot of burden. So, by the way, they are adding another psychological trauma on us. If we really want to end FGM, we need to embrace the survivors. Let us tell them, come out. We want to hear, why, why are you forcing your daughter to go through FGM when you have undergone it? You know the pain. You understand better than us. Why are you still? What's the driving force? For me, I, I'm standing and saying my daughter will not go through the cut. Why is another survivor opting for her daughter to go through the cut? Why? Because they fear the stigma within the community. For me, I want to talk about it. Someone else, so another survivor, also fears the stigma of the outside world. For survivor, you know, Jeremiah, you are online, right? If you see about how people post issues on FGM. They want to talk, yes, the effects of FGM. But for me as a survivor, sometimes, and they tag me. <laughs> I just read and say, hey, hey, oh God, just help me. Give me the courage to retweet this. Because how can I, how can I endorse something that I feel it's burning? Actually, it's like hitting the nail, a nail on a wound. A, a, a hot rod inside a wound. Already I've gone through all this trauma. Now you are there online talking about survivors. How do you want me to support you and end FGM? You know, at some point, if I'm not strong enough, if I'm that weak, I would opt it out and say, okay, go ahead with your campaigns. And for us to win, the ending FGM. Jeremy, let me challenge you again. If today, for example, 
um you want to end fgm you meet a woman who is not cut and you you meet a woman who has been cut now whose daughter will go through the cut if you meet an uncut woman a woman who probably maybe escaped the cut whether by chance or um, by other means she was rescued or something else or maybe her community does not even practice fgm at all or and compare now a survivor whose daughter will go through the cut because of a background of their 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 mothers having been cut then i'd say the girls whose mothers have gone through it already ah good now now you are getting the point you know if and you you have gone through the cut that's a norm it's already something that's a norm in your community right so most probably like 90% of girls who come from a community that practices fgm daughters of survivors are most likely to go through the cut compared to daughters of uncut women whether they escaped whether they escaped by chance whether their community does not practice then that tells you where we should bring our energy our where should our focus go we need to tell these survivors you went through it we start the debate there we start our conversation there under the tree telling them you went through this why do you want to allow your daughter go through the same this is a survivor you know even the men who want to end fgm how will they end fgm if survivors are not telling them the truth that yes we went through fgm and it was horrible if these survivors will come out and say no there is nothing wrong with fgm how will these men end fgm how will the religious leaders end fgm if these survivors are still if they still feel it's okay to go through the cut because at the end of the day it's these women who take these girls to the bush because this is something they believe if the girl doesn't go through the cut they believe there is something wrong with that girl you see and this a survivor when who went through the cut who who knows the pain all those agony but still wants to go to make sure her daughter also goes through the cut you see that's why i say we need to give psycho- psychological support to this um tr- uh, counseling to the survivors also tell them why their daughters should not go through the cut we should stop victimizing survivors we should stop uh intimidating and insul- insulting survivors we should embrace them rather um uh, ask them what they went through let them share their stories for positive change we begin from there now from there we involve the men now tell them okay these survivors have gone through fgm now they have their daughters we want to spare their daughters will you accept to marry these girls when when they have not even gone through the cut that's another point these men will now accept right they will, they will be ready to marry the uncut girls now we go to the religious perspective as well now telling them if you don't practice fgm there is no sin that will befall you because it's not even part of our religion that will clean their heart and they will feel at ease that yes if you don't practice fgm it's okay even in our religion you see now we will have a collective issue men accepting the uncut girls survivors also feeling that it's okay for their daughters not to go through the same we will have the religious leaders who are also condemning the cut and also saying it's okay for girls not to be cut at all we want zero fgm sadia i want to bring this to a close one takeaway that i have gotten from this conversation is basically you know engage people who are relevant first of all you have religious leaders who are um people who would advise in terms of religion and something that's also very important in other communities who do not have such a structured religion things like traditional traditional setups on religion uh one other thing that i have taken home today is the importance of demystifying um some um myths 
uh, things like, you know, uh, someone is unclean, and also bringing out facts um, in the fight against FGM is also something that I've taken home. We would like to bring this to a close, but I, I don't want you to, to leave this place, uh, or I don't want to leave this place without you just encouraging someone who's going to, who is, who is starting his campaign. Just give them a word of encouragement. Someone who's starting an organization, someone who's running a campaign, someone who's just passionate about this work. What, what do you want to tell them? Ending FGM requires passion, not money. When you have the passion, money will come itself. But you can have millions of money, but still no impact. Like, for instance, I want to bring to your attention, we have so many organizations that are working towards ending FGM. If you go to the grassroots where real FGM is happening, there is no impact. So you see, basically, for an employee working in an organization and for an activist, it's totally different. For an activist who is passionate, I'm talking about the, the real genuine activists who want to actually start a campaign to end FGM in their communities. They shouldn't give up. Why? Because for an employee, today they will be ending FGM, tomorrow they will go to environment, the other day they will go to energy, the other day they will be uh, politicians. You know, they will be changing. These are employees. But for activists, a real passionate act For me, even if today I become a politician, my passion for ending FGM will never change. Because that's my passion. Whether I become a politician, whether I become a businesswoman, whether I'm a, I'm a wife, whether I get married to whoever, whether I, I'm, I'm, I have children or not, that doesn't change my vision. My vision is to, to have a free FGM world. You see? Now, uh, the advice I want to give to um, the campaigners out there, don't give up. And don't think that ending FGM requires money. Yes, we need resources. But what kind of resources do we need? We don't need conferences, so, ma so much endless conferences. People will, will ask me, why conferences? I'm saying conferences. I'm not condemning all conferences. I'm not condemning all of them. I'm saying we should minimize. Let's minimize conferences. Jeremiah, if today, let's say, for example, the millions spent in conferences are being taken to the rural areas, the grassroots, where FGM practically happens, today I'm sure we would be talking about something tangible, something practical, something that we would say these are the, the lives we have touched. We should now focus on going to grassroots, Talking to, the, to that woman who is cutting the girls, talking to that woman whose daughter is about to go through the cut, talking to the religious leaders, that's what I believe. For those activists who want to come up and do NFGM campaigns, actually come to this campaign knowing that you are not competing with anybody. You want to save a girl even if it's a one, one girl. That's a big step for us. Make sure that you struggle uh, doing that. Don't focus competing on what Saudi is doing, competing on what Jeremiah is doing. We are not competing. We should rather combine our efforts. You are doing NFGM podcast. I'm doing grassroots campaign. Someone else would be doing media. Someone else would be doing something else. Can we now bring all this together? as one effort, because our goal is to end FGM. And we should all come up, uh, there is something we should understand. You know, when you are doing something, we cannot all walk with the same speed. We can't, we are human beings. The speed I will be having can be more than yours. My speed should be an inspiration to you it should not make you inferior. Can you look at Saadi as a role model? Can you look at my work as an inspiration to build on yours? You should not start, should, 
pulling me down so that we, we come to the same level. No, build on what I have. Learn from me. Let's work together and move as a team. Maybe you ask me how I progressed. What are my best practices? Then you go and, and do the same in your community. For me, I would say, let's all work together. Let's make sure that our efforts all are combined. If GM affects health, it's an health issue, it's an educational issue, it's an economical issue, it's everyone's issue. Now, uh, the health sector, the education sector, the children, services, all these also departments should also come together for the, for the best interest of the child. If the children's officers are doing their own things, if the local administration are doing their own things, if the NGOs are doing their own things, when are we going to achieve? Everybody is looking for profiling, profiling and branding. I'm the best, I'm the best. No, it doesn't work that way. Can we have, can we have combined efforts for the best interest of the child? At the end of the day, we want zero FGM. That's it. It's been long into the interview, and uh, I just want to bring this to a close. We have so much to talk about, but um, how does someone reach out to you? I know you are very active online, and uh, you are also very active um, on the ground. How does someone reach you? Do you have a physical location? Do you have a phone number? Uh, do you have email address or social media handles? Uh, this is Saadia. As Saadia personal, I have my Twitter account at Saadia H. How, how does someone write Sadia? It just spell it because I, I don't know how to spell this. S-A-D-E-A-R. Sadia. Sadia. Yes, that's what I, I meant. Okay. At Sadia H is my Twitter handle. And for Facebook, it's Sadia Sango Hussein. That's it. That's simple. And when we, we you come to my organization... I have, I have another personal email, sadiasango at gmail.com. When it comes to Daya, we have at Daya Group, Twitter account. We have Daya Group Kenya at gmail.com. We also have an office in Hola, Tana River. When you come to our office, it's just uh, opposite the Hola Stadium. It's strategic somewhere that anyone can just come. If you go to Hola and Ask Daya Women Group. Everyone knows. And they will bring, even in, to my home, they will bring even to, to you, to even my compound. So Daya is actually a community-owned, a community-based organization. But we made it that in such a way that everyone in the community feels Daya is theirs. Amazing. That was Sadia Hussein. Such an amazing conversation we've had today. For me, it's been much more of listening and learning because, you know, you meet different people, different experiences, and this is one unique one. Thank you very much, Sadia, for joining me here today. Um, it's an honor, honestly, being able to sit down and listen to you and you sharing very openly what you do and what you feel about the issue that you are working with. So thank you very much. And to the listener, thank you for holding on to this conversation it's also an honor having you. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. This is the NFGM podcast produced by me, Jeremiah Kipainoi, in partnership, of course, with Tony Mwebia here in Kenya. Till next time, take care. You can get bonus materials, notes, and much more at www.kipainoi.com. K I P A I N O I dot com. Please remember, we all can do something. Go out and make a difference, for we all have a responsibility to make this world a better place. Goodbye.